Many times, we need to fit functions other than polynomials to a set of data. There are a wide range of these types of functions, but I'll talk about just a couple of them in this video. I'll show you some tricks that let us use a straight line curve fit to create these types of functions. Power functions, for example, are in the form of x to some power beta, which can be a non-integer, times a coefficient alpha. Another common class of functions are exponentials. Examples of those are functions in the form alpha e to the beta x and alpha times 10 to the beta x. All of these types of functions can be transformed into linear functions by using logarithms. We can then perform a curve fit of the linear function and undo the transformation to determine the coefficients alpha and beta in these functions. The approaches presented here for these functions are also applicable to some other types of functions, but I'll just go over a couple of examples in this video. Before using logarithms to transform our equations, let's talk about logarithms and some of their properties. In a sense, logarithms are an inverse of exponentiation. So by applying a logarithm, you can undo an exponent. Suppose we have a function x equals a to the yth power, where a is a number and x and y are variables. If you take a logarithm that has base a of x, you get y back. So the base a logarithm of a to the y is y. This may not seem like much of an improvement, but there are some properties of logarithms that make this useful. One property of logarithms that we'll use is their ability to convert multiplication to addition. The logarithm of the product of two numbers is equal to the logarithms of the individual numbers added up. So the log of x times y is equal to the sum of the log of x plus the log of y. Another useful property is that the logarithm of a number x raised to the nth power is the same as n times the logarithm of x. So logarithms can also be used to convert exponentiation to multiplication. Finally, there are a few choices of bases for logarithms that are given special names. A logarithm whose base is the number e is called a natural logarithm and it's generally indicated as ln. A base 10 logarithm is denoted by log, typically with no base indicated by a subscript. Octave has two functions that calculate logarithms. The log 10 function returns the base 10 logarithm of its argument. The log function returns the natural logarithm of its argument. These tend to be the most commonly used logarithms. Now let's talk about using logarithms to perform an exponential curve fit. The form of the function we want to fit to the data is alpha times e to the beta x. If we take the natural logarithm of this equation, we get the natural log of y is equal to the natural log of alpha plus beta times x. If y is a number, then natural log of y is a number, and if alpha is a number, then natural log of alpha is a number. So taking the natural log of the exponential function has converted the equation to a straight line of the form y is equal to m times x plus b, except that its vertical axis is now natural log of y, its slope is beta, and the y-intercept is natural log of alpha. We can fit this straight line to our data with the polyfit command. Just send the polyfit function the natural log of the measured y data. It'll return the slope and the y-intercept of the straight line. Beta is the slope of the straight line, so beta is just p of 1. The y-intercept of the straight line curve fit is the natural log of alpha, so alpha is e to the y-intercept. Exponential functions are a particularly useful type of function. They describe the response of a system with a single energy storage element. The example I'm going to look at is the speed of a rotating flywheel that's allowed to drift to a stop. So first, I'll show how the data measuring this is acquired, and then I'll do some curve fitting to estimate the parameters in the exponential curve that describes the flywheel speed. This is a DC motor. It's connected to a flywheel. If I apply a constant voltage to the motor, it'll spin the flywheel. This motor has what's called a Hall effect sensor. That provides a voltage which indicates the motor speed. 
I'm going to measure the motor speed after I turn the power off. A curve fit of that data provides all the important parameters that govern the motor's response. The form of the natural response for this system is an exponential function. V of t is the flywheel velocity as a function of time after the motor is turned off. When time is equal to zero, the e to the beta t term is one, so that alpha is just the initial speed of the flywheel right after I turn off the motor. The beta term is the inverse of what is called the time constant of this system. The time constant is a measure of how quickly the system responds to an input. It's a fundamental parameter of this type of system. So once we've found that, we know a lot about the system. To do this curve fit, I'll convert this equation to linear form by taking the logarithm of both sides. Next, I'll use octave to perform a least squares best fit to determine the values for the natural log of alpha and beta. From the natural log of alpha, I can find alpha itself. Finally, I'll plug the values for alpha and beta back into the original equation and plot that along with the data to make sure that our solution makes sense. I recorded the response data with an oscilloscope and saved it as a text file. I'll import the data file using the load command. I put the data file in my current working directory so I can use the syntax load motor response dot DAT with a space dash ASCII. I'll check the size of the data by typing size of motor response. There are 5,000 pairs of time and speed data. Time is in the first column and speed is in the second. For convenience, I'll put the first column of the data file in a variable named T and the second column, the speed, in a variable named v. It's always a good idea to take a look at the data before doing any analysis on it. So I'll plot speed versus time. I'll use dots to denote the data points. The data are pretty noisy and exist only at specific voltage levels, which I sort of expect based on the way the Hall effect sensor works. Next, I'll do my curve fit. For reasons that I'll discuss later, I'm going to use only the first 2,500 data points for the curve fit. So the first argument to the polyfit command is then t of 1 to 2,500. And the second argument is the log of v of 1 to 2,500. The final argument is 1, since I'm fitting a straight line to the data. To get the coefficients in the exponential curve, I set alpha to e to the second element of p. Beta is just the first element of p, so beta equals p of 1. Now I'll plot the curve fit and the data for the entire 5,000 points. First, I need to evaluate the function for the values of time in my t-vector. Finally, I'll plot the data along with the curve fit. The curve fit looks pretty good compared to the data, especially considering that only the first half of the data were used in the curve fit. Now I'll do the same process, but fit a third order polynomial to the data. I'll still use only the first 2,500 points for the curve fit, but I'll evaluate the polynomial for the entire 5,000 points when I compare the result to the data. Finally, I'll plot the data and the curve fit over the entire time period. The curve fit's pretty good for the first half of the time period but things start to look really strange after that. The curve fit is saying that after the motor is turned off, the flywheel will slow down for a while, but will then start to speed up again. This is obviously wrong since it's not physically reasonable. This example emphasizes that it's important to use what you know about the system when fitting curves to data. The exponential curve fit was based on some physical insight into the system, and it worked out great. The polynomial was chosen pretty arbitrarily, and it fails even the simplest sanity test miserably. 
The point here is that choosing a random function type to represent your data is usually a bad idea. You always want to understand something about the system and choose a function that reflects its expected behavior. There are a lot of other approaches for curve fitting. Some of these can be dealt with using the techniques in this chapter and others can't. The next topic will be interpolation. This is similar to curve fitting in that it allows us to estimate values of a function between provided points. However, interpolation assumes that all of the given data points are correct, rather than trying to find a best overall approximation to a set of data.